the most incomprehensible thing about the universe is that it is comprehensible. Welcome to Island Influencers, where we share stories of successful business owners, experienced professionals, entrepreneurs and community leaders based or with influence in the Isle of Man. This podcast is brought to you by Thornton Chartered Financial Planners, because great financial planning has the power to change your life. Now here's your host, Chartered Financial Planner, Sharon Sutton. My guest this week is astronomer and chairman of the Manx Retirement Association, Howard Parkin. I hope you enjoy hearing Howard's stories, including how he literally took the Isle of Man into space. This is a fascinating episode and I hope you enjoy it. So welcome, Howard, to Island Influences. My pleasure. It's nice to be here. You've got so many things that you've you've done throughout your um, your career uh, and still doing. So I, I wonder if, if before we, we get into that, if we just go back in time a bit and you tell me um, where you were born, where you grew up. I was born in Liverpool. Yeah. I was born in Liverpool in 1953. And uh, my parents lived in the suburbs of Liverpool, a place called Egbeth, near the Cricket Crown, which most yes. people know of. Yes. And I... Lived there till I was about um, 1972, so I was 19 when I left Liverpool. Yeah. I went down to Somerset for a, about a year, and then I came back. Um, my parents came back to, well, they didn't come back to Liverpool. They decided to retire in the Isle of Man, or partially retire in the Isle of Man, and I came with them. Oh, wow. I went to teach a training college, met my wife. And yes. All the rest of the stuff happened from there, but primarily I'm a Liverpool lad. Right, so you were, you were teacher training, you did teacher training in Liverpool? No, in Padgate in, uh, in Warrington. Right. And my wife was from Manchester, I was from Liverpool, and we met in the middle. Oh my, okay. So you, you, did, um, you came over to the Isle of Man as a, as a young teacher I, then? I, well, no, because uh, unfortunately I came to the Isle of Man with my parents initially, then went away to training college just yeah. after that. Mm-hmm. Um, but when I came out of teacher training college, I couldn't get a job in teaching, so oh, I came back to the Isle of Man and took up a position with Heron and Brearley yes. at the brewery, yes. uh, where I worked for 20 odd years before I moved to Manx National Heritage and became a civil servant. Right, okay. So you you moved to, um, so you, when did you start at Manx National Heritage? Uh, the 1997. 90s? Yeah, 1997, gosh. Just in, in January 97. Yeah, I guess things were just starting to grow then. The- well, I was taken on primarily because they had um, opened the House of Mananin. No, I'll no, start again. They actually uh, were going to open the House of Mananin later that year so yeah. as part of the process of um, developing Manx National Heritage and the product of the story of man and all that sort of stuff they um, had this plan to open the House of Mananin and they took on I think about half a dozen new civil servants including myself yeah. and I took on the role as public services manager right. where I stayed until I retired in 2012. Wow and so how did you get into astronomy? Well, that's a long story, and yeah. uh, I can tell you because I've got plenty of time to talk about it. But basically, um, my first memory of being interested in astronomy wasn't astronomy; it was a space flight. And I remember, as a young boy, I can actually pin the date down to the fourteenth of April, nineteen sixty-one. Right. Because at the time, I lived in the pool, and kids played out in the street in those days, and yeah. my friends were playing out in the road, playing football. And my mother came outside and said to us, boys, boys, come on in. I want you to watch this man on television. He's just been into space. And it was Yuri Gagarin yeah. mar- being marched through the streets of Moscow and Red Square and all that sort of stuff, because he indeed had been the first man in yes. space on the 12th of April. And I was just amazed. I was an eight-year-old boy. Was I seven? I was eight. I was seven, actually, mm. uh, 1961, April. And as a consequence, I was just absolutely blown away by wow. this idea that this man had been into space. Absolute wow, you know. Yeah, yeah. And of course, just after that, um, Americans went into space with Alan Shepard and then John, John F. Kennedy made his speech about going to the moon. And the whole space flight stuff just fascinated me. And, yeah, sure. Uh, um, that was it. I was hooked on the subject of space flight from 61 onwards. My next sort of memory about uh, astronomy as such uh, comes around in 1966. So a few years later, um, I used to be allowed to stay up. You know, I was a lot younger then. Yeah. Um, not like nowadays. <laughs> <laughs> bed early. But, um, yeah, another feeling. <laughs> um, but what happened in 1966 is we had a meteor shower. The yeah. meteor shower, the Leonid meteor shower, which peaks basically every November but it was expected to be a real storm, a meteor storm, we call it, in November 1966. And Patrick Moore on his Sky at Night program um, 
you could write in and get this map of the sky and it would show you where the Leonid meters would come from. So I sent for this map and I was fascinated. And my dad, bless him, he's long gone now, but my dad, bless him, took me up to this field in Liverpool. Anyone who knows Liverpool, there's a field called Holtz Field. Yeah. And he took me up there at three o'clock in the morning to watch this meteor shower and we yeah. saw three very faint, nondescript meters. <laughs> At least you knew what you're looking for. Well, we found. I, I've actually <laughs> still got the map, and there's still pencil marks on it showing where these meters were. We found. Gosh. But there's a lovely sequel to that story, which uh, might be out of context now. You can put it in later. Yeah. Is because when I do lectures on cruise ships, I, one of my lectures I do is about meteors and meteorites. And um, I was talking about this meteor shower that was meant to peak in 1966 in November. And it didn't peak in the British Isles, but it did peak over Arizona in the United States of America. And this lady came up to me after my lecture and said, you know, I remember as a small girl, my mum and dad took me out to see this meteor shower. Just like and you. we saw thousands and thousands oh, of them. Wow. And there was 40,000 an hour, yeah. something like that. Gosh. And she said, I think it was in February 1967. And I said, no, it wasn't. It was November 1966 because you were right in the place. And she was amazed and I was amazed. And I thought, it's incredible that sort yeah. of coincidence uh, and that's one of the great things about doing the, the lectures on cruise ships there uh, but that was a real memory and then after that of course my, my interest in astronomy just grew and grew and grew and grew yeah, and of course sure. the landing on the moon and all that sort of stuff and it stayed with me right through till probably about 1973 something like that and um, when the moon landings finished and so on and uh, i went to, to college in 72 yeah and um got involved in other things should we say and um but that's where it's all started from yeah, okay. So my parents moved down to Somerset and my dad actually took a pub. Yeah. And um, I actually, because I couldn't, um, I went with them to, to Somerset. Yeah. And um, it didn't work out for my dad. They didn't enjoy the industry or the business. So they chose to leave Somerset and come back to the North West. Yeah. And I always remember the choice was the Isle of Man or North Wales. Yes. And I'm ever so glad they picked the Isle of Man. <laughs> At that point, I applied to go to teacher training college and I went to Padgate and met yeah. my wife and all the rest. But I got my position with Heron and Brearley because I'd worked for Courages and I was looking for a job. I couldn't get a job in teaching, as I mentioned earlier. Yeah. So as a consequence, I went to... Um, a whole host of different places. I always remember I got offered four jobs those days. Gosh. I got off a job at ShopRite as a trainee manager. I got a job at a job with Manx Petroleums in the office. I got offered a job with Rural Industries in the office and Heron and Brearley Gosh. as a customs and excise documentation clerk. My word. It's a bit it of a sounds, mouthful. It is, isn't it? And I went for the brewery job. Yeah. And I enjoyed the job. We'd just got married, my wife and I, in the August of 75. I enjoyed the job. We had our children in 78 and 1980. But I always had this yen to teach. I always had this ambition to teach. I always yes. enjoyed teaching. It's a calling, you know, isn't it? It really yeah. is a calling. Yeah. And there was no possibility of my doing any teaching, um, obviously in my position at, the, at uh, Heron and Brayley. And so probably I, any of the other three positions that you got offered on. No, either. no, not yeah. really. There, there was no but, chance. But yeah. there was just no vacancies for teachers at that time. My wife was also a teacher, obviously, and she couldn't get a job in teaching oh, either. Gosh. So she went yeah. to work for um, Phoenix Insurance in Apple yeah. Street. yeah. And life was grand and we had the children and all the rest, but I just had this hankering. And one day, I don't know why I did it, but I went along to the Isle of Man College, as it was known then. I met a chap called Bev Sharp, who was the head of adult education. And I said, could I teach um, geography, which is my subject? I did geography and would you believe physical education were my subject? Right. Uh, hence the cycling. <laughs> Absolutely, you arrived here on your, on your e-bike this Absolutely. morning, which is, which is great. Absolutely, it was a lovely morning. They said it was going to rain and it's lovely. Yeah. So I went across to see the Bev Sharp there and I said to him, can I teach? You know, I'd like to get my probationary year done because you had to do your probationary year, I think within 10 years. I think that okay. was a motivation for my going to see him. Yes. Um, and he said, well, we don't teach academic subjects, um, adult education classes. Right. We only do hobbies and um, More vocational stuff, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Have you any interests? And I said, well, I used to be fascinated with astronomy. And he said, just the job, he said. We've got Halley's <laughs> Comet coming around in 85 stroke 86. How do you fancy coming to teach astronomy here at the college? And I thought about it. I thought, why not? I'll give it a go. And that's how I got into teaching yeah, astronomy. Yeah. And that's how I got back into the subject. But again, it's amazing when you look back in life how these things happen. Yeah. 
I very quickly realized that, um, incidentally, I'm still teaching. I started teaching this week. Um, it was my 36th year continually. I've been teaching at the Alloway College. Oh, my word. Congratulations. Uh, I used to be a college lecturer. Now I'm a university lecturer. Oh, it's yes. Far more, it's far, yeah. Sounds far better, doesn't it? it? Do, yeah, it's very more prestigious. <laughs> so uh, what happened was I started teaching astronomy and I very quickly realized that I didn't know enough to teach it. I really was struggling. Um, I, I knew the basics, but that was it. And they always say, you've got to be able to, you've got to know a little bit more than those you're teaching. And I was really struggling. So I thought, I know what I'll do. The same time the brewery had sent me on a management course uh, to learn a, um, how to be a manager, uh, the certificate in management studies, it was called. That was in early 90s, I suspect that was. And I enjoyed it. Yeah. I actually enjoyed studying. So Doing the teaching of the astronomy and doing the, um, the management course, I went back to the brewery when I got the certificate. I said, you know, I'd like to carry on and do some more educational activities. Oh, no, we have no time for that. We need to be really concentrating on um, what we do. And I was, by this time, I was, I think by that time, I was the marketing manager of the brewery at that time. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I progressed to that position, whether it was before then or after, I can't really remember. Yeah. But um, I said, well, that's a shame. I'd really like to do some more studying. I, I feel that's something that I could do. Well, there's no, um, there's nothing available, so just crack on, basically. And mm. I understood that, and yeah, there's yeah. no, no um, regret about that. But it had awakened a desire in me. So what did I do? I went and did an open university degree, didn't I? In yes. astronomy, yes. In earth sciences and astronomy. Got my degree in 1994. I'm still teaching, of course, at the college. A lot of astronomy I learned in that. I hated it. Academic uh, astrophysics and that. I can do it, I can understand it, but I just don't like it. It's right, not okay. for me. I would never have liked to have done an astrophysics degree hmm. at university other than the fact that I did this one with the Open University. I actually did geology and climatology and all sorts of stuff. But the astronomy gave me the tools to carry on teaching on the astronomy side. And that's what I carried on doing. And I got a letter from the Open University, probably in 95, 90, no, it must be 96. Yes, it must be 96 to say, did you get a degree? Incidentally, they changed it from BA to BSC yeah. just when I graduated, which was handy. Yes. So I did the degree, um, passed it, of course, but there was no um, career gain from it whatsoever. I did. I was working for the brewery. Yeah. Well, well done. Thank you very much. Begin on with your work sort of thing. Yeah, oh, fair sure. enough. You know, I've yeah. carried on doing the stuff for the college. It's changed a bit now. <laughs> well, what happened then was um, I got this uh, letter from the Open University to say, um, has it affected your career? Yeah. And I wrote back, not a jot. But then an advert appeared, probably in late 96, in the newspaper um, about wanting a public services manager for Manx National Heritage and one of the prerequisites, you had to be a graduate. There you go. Fantastic. Qualifications I, do pay after all. Qualifications do pay. <laughs> Has anyone ask, ever asked me that question? Is yes. it worth it? You may not think there's any advantage or any reason why you should do it. No, I, I totally it, agree. It worked for me mm. and uh, the rest is history. I went to work for Manx National Heritage and I'd been doing some talks to people uh, about astronomy around the island to WIs and um, rotary groups and that sort of stuff, but not a lot. But although I was um, in what we call the Public Services Division of Manx National Heritage, the curatorial staff, the professional staff, um, thankfully, uh, and I look back on that with, with you know, with uh, delight that they did it, recognised that I did know a lot about astronomy. So I gave the occasional lecture for Manx National Heritage as well. Oh, good. And that's what got me more into the, the lecturing, uh, the more um, academic side of lecturing rather than yes. just casual okay. chatting at the um, And that's WIs. opened up all sorts of uh, well, opportunities, was, uh, hasn't it, really? It has indeed. And that's where I, I, where I am. Well, that's where I started from, if you like, yeah. the, the main lecturing. So that's yeah, potted no, that, history of how I got to where we yeah, are now. And then, of yeah. course, the other things came along as a consequence. Yeah, I know. That's, that's really... That's really interesting. Thank, thanks for sharing that. Lot, I mean, lots of stuff there. Yeah, you. <laughs> that, that you that you then managed to get on and um, you you got involved with the the observatory as well. That's um, yes. Now that's interesting because a lot of people think that my interest in astronomy helped found the observatory, but it didn't. It didn't because I actually I always boast I started teaching astronomy at the Alman College as was then in 1985. The observatory or the astronomical society was founded in 1989. So it predated that, but yeah, it's I predated still... that with my teaching. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But it didn't matter. I mean, I remember that vividly. We went there. I gave a talk. We had our first meeting in 89 in the in May 89 at the Craigna Bar. Yeah. 
And I remember putting the project, the slide projector on the snooker table <laughs> to project <laughs> the slides onto the wall. Yeah, sure. And then um, that's how, how we started. And then, of course, we've got the observatory since and all the rest. And, uh, yeah, it's, 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 it's all f- grown phenomenally. Uh, yeah, I know, it's, it's a great institute. It, you know, it I've, I've been to it. Um, they do quite a lot of voluntary nights <laughs> for things like um, the Scouts and the cu- do cub, Cubs. Yeah, we went to a cu- yeah. Cubs group from around um, a few years ago. Well, we've just started something I've been wanting to do for years. Is, is We've actually announced literally this week, last Saturday, we've decided to do open nights to the public. Yeah. Oh, great. Through Eventbrite. Yeah. And um, so I had this suggestion a while ago. I and mean, we finally got around to doing it for this October. The first yes. one will be the 30th of October. Yes, Halloween, funny enough. Well, the day after Halloween, yes. Yeah. It was, we didn't want to do it on Halloween because kids aren't going. It's, it's aimed at adults and children. Yeah, sure. So we're doing it on Friday the 30th. I put the tickets, 40 tickets through Eventbrite on sale yeah. from last Saturday. Yeah. Sold out by Monday morning. Goodness completely. me. Only four, and I've been inundated with people wanting them for the next one. So Yeah, so that's great. Are you doing them for free or are you no, charging No, no, we're, we're charging for them because that, we actually have, we, we yeah. have issues with funds at the moment because yeah. we used to do the Top of the snow fell, pie in the sky. Yes, I know. Um, yeah. Which was something we've been doing for many years. But yeah. of course, this year, it's gone by the board. No, it's something um, I always wanted to do, actually. Never well, got around it, it to it doing. It is great fun. Yeah. We were doing the pie in the sky for Top of snow fell. And uh, what happened was, of course, we lost them. The revenue for those because of the um, COVID situation. So we ummed and ahed how we can do things about it. So that sort of prompted us to do the open uh, society nights. Believe it or not, we reckon it costs us about, well, I won't go to figures, but it costs us quite a bit to open the observatory. We've got the fuel, we've got the heat yes. and the light, and all yeah, that yeah. sort of stuff, the insurance. We've just had a major failure of the, the dome, actually, which, frankly, uh, some of our members are fixing. We're very grateful that they fixed it. But um, it does, does cost money, so yeah, we sure. realise we need to um, charge for visits, which we do for the, for the Cubs and the Scouts and visiting groups. We thought, well, let's do it on a public basis. And see what, if there's any demand. Well, the demand is there, and uh, yeah, sure. Hopefully, we're, we're pr- planning to do them probably every month um, yeah. throughout the winter. Yes, um, and then stop them in the summer. Good dark and, skies, <laughs> exactly, and uh, it'll get, get us the revenue yeah. to pay our costs and cover our expenses. So. No, that's good. Well, Howard, I mean, I wonder if you'd, you'd mind um, sharing though the way that you got in, involved in the Max Retirement Association was via one of your lectures. It was indeed, yes. So, ha- tell me a bit about that. Well, what happened with that was um, when I. Um, when I retired, and I, I hesitate because I didn't retire, I took, um, I resigned. Right. Because this is a, it's a lovely little anecdotal story because I was um, working and it was 2012 and the, somebody came up to me and said, have you heard about Mars? Of course I know about Mars. I'm an yeah. astronomer. Mars is in Leo at the moment or wherever it was in the sky. No, not that Mars. Mutually agreed resignation scheme. Oh, yes. Mars. <laughs> so... I found out about it. I yeah. applied for it. I didn't get it originally. Then I did get it. It basically you retired early and you got a financial incentive to do so. Yeah. So I that's how I retired. Uh, I retired in um, December 2012. Yes. I set up my company Astromanx in December in January 13 and so on. And I was invited to go and give a talk to the Manx Retirement Association, which I thought was fine. I think this was 2014 by then. So I said yes, of course. I give them a talk. I give. I freely talk about astronomy, as you've probably yeah. noticed already. I'll talk about the subject yes. like cows come home. <laughs> and um, I gave them a lecture. And while I was giving the lecture, after the lecture, which went down quite well, I was handed an application. Well, you might be interested in joining us. Right. Rest is history. I joined the MRA and um, I thoroughly enjoyed it. My wife joined with me, obviously. Um, we do monthly lunches. We go out and do things. We do exciting things. We've... Um, we had a disco a few weeks ago. We had a lockdown release disco. Goodness. Uh, we've been to Eight Man. Um, we've all been clambering around the trees of Eight Man. And the point is, it is a social group. It's a social group. And um, one of our mottos is, um, there are no strangers, only friends you haven't met yet. Yes, And nice. we're, we're providing a service. There's about 400 members, roughly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And we're providing a service for people who, you know, some people, couples like myself and my wife, and there's quite a few couples, obviously, but there's quite a few single people yeah, who are sure. either single because they've never got married or they've been bereaved, either men or women. And um, it's something that we have a great time. We have a monthly uh, a meeting, a, a monthly luncheon. We play whist, we play a rummy co, we do mini golf, we do bowls, we have a stretch and flex, um, um, keep fit se- uh, section every um, Thursday morning. And it's great. Sounds ideal. And it really is. It's um, it, I love it. And um, It's based from Ramsey, right? It's, it's re- it, well, the office Ramsey. is in Ramsey, but yeah. it, it's basically, it's all over the island. There's no, yeah. there's just a... No admi- borders, right. No, there's an administrative um, office in there. We have a, okay. um, we have a, a lady who works for us on a 
three mornings a week. Yeah. Well, it's meant to be three mornings a week. She does far more because there's so much going on. Yeah, sure. So I've been in the MRA for about three years. And right. uh, as ever, would you consider joining the committee? And of course yeah. I did because I felt I could contribute something yeah, and sure. make some suggestions and ideas. I'd taken them to the observatory at least once, maybe twice. So I joined the committee. Yeah. And then unfortunately the former chairman... Of the well, the director is the official title. The former director. You, your trustees aren't you? It's, aren't you trustees or, as opposed to a company? Is it is it a company or is it a charity? It's a charity. Yeah, we are so a charity. We're a registered so charity. Be, so be trustees then. Yeah, and that's why I'm a director. I think. Right. It, okay. It's, it's, it's. I mean, I tell everybody I'm the chairman, but I'm the director. Officially, my title is director. Okay. Because what happened is Brian Brian Tittington, who was the um, director, um, he left the island. His right. family across and all the rest, and they'd come yeah, to the island, sure. but they they went back across. So. We needed a new director, and the lady who does all the work for the MRA, I don't mind naming her Barbara Mason, she does an all marvellous job, she did not want to be director. She no. still wanted someone else who would be sort of, I suppose, a figurehead, really, someone not who was to, known. And not and, afraid to get up on their feet yeah, and talk. Uh, lots of lots of women, women don't like no, doing I mean, that. No, Barbara's great at what yeah. she does, but she didn't want, want to be the figurehead, as it were. And yeah, then, sure. I obviously knew I did talks and that, and it was suggestive, and I took on the role of director and I agreed and here we are. Yeah, so how many members are you at at the moment? We're about 360. We, we just had a gym committee meeting, ironically, in St. John's last Saturday and yeah. the figures for the last three months, I think, I think we lost 20 for obvious reasons, people yeah. moving away or sadly dying on us, yeah. um, but we gained 27. Right. So Nice stable number then. It, yeah. it is, and we, we feel that's the right number to cope with and to deal with, because if we have many more members, it would be a, a come administrative problem. Yeah, you have to be um, really fast yeah. to get along to, yes. to, to find out about something and to go, otherwise it's sort well, of oversubscribed, it. I guess. Well, this particular year, it's been a horrible year with the virus yeah, and all sure. the rest, but since we started up again in July, um, we've been inundated with new people wanting to come along. Right, okay. And, um, We've been oversubscribed. We had our lunch in September. I couldn't go to it because I was across in England, as I mentioned earlier. But mm. uh, unfortunately, um, or oh, fortunately, I should say, the um, the lunch, the first lunch after lockdown, which was in September, we had 120, which we usually have about 80 and 90, and this was yeah. 120. It was incredible. Yeah. Everyone had cabin fever, I guess, at I that I think point. so. And, and we're finding more and more, I think we're finding this with the observatory visits. I think people on the island are wanting to do things. <laughs> My night school classes, I had, yeah. when I came back um, three weeks ago, I came back three weeks ago, I had one on the register. The class wasn't going to run after 35 years. Yeah. The classes were going to end. Oh, gosh. In the course of the next two weeks, I got another 14. Right, okay. So, so, you, it's, yeah. so it just keeps going. Yeah, good. Like the Energizer Bunny. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> well, yeah, I guess you have to. So how, the... Um, so, so you, I noticed you've been all over the world delivering your yeah. your lectures. Do you, do you take a message from the Isle of Man when you... Almost certainly. ...when you go... I tell people I'm from the Isle of Man, a small island in the middle of the Irish Sea and the centre of the uh, the British Isles. I always have great delight. I heard on Mike Rennie the other day, they were saying that if you draw a line from Johnny Groats to Land's End, it goes straight through the middle of the Isle of Man. Gosh. And uh, actually, the church at St... Oh, I forgot the name of the church. St. Luke's, I think it is. What's one St. Luke's. Is it the one in the middle? Yeah. Now, that, is, that is, I understand, the geographical centre of the British Isles. Is it? Oh, right. And that's why there are stone circles there and all sorts, not stone oh. circles, but monuments there and all sorts yeah, of... Yeah, yeah. Centre of the University, aren't Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. But no, I always make a point of um, <laughs> flying my Manx flag and uh, have a flag on my, my, um, my cabin door, my suite, sorry, yes. stateroom door. Yes. But the lecturing came about, uh, it's another lovely anecdotal story because in 2011... Uh, my mother-in-law was 90. She sadly passed away in 2015. But she was 90 years of age and she, she'd she been widowed since 1999. Yeah. And she, um, we wanted to do something for her 90th birthday. Oh, yeah. So, <laughs> what should we do? Should we take her on a cruise? Because she loved cruising. Mm. Where should we go? Should we go to the Caribbean? Been there, done that. How about across the Atlantic? Done that. How about the men? Done that. How about the Baltic? Done that. How about Norway? Oh, we haven't done Norway. Yeah, lovely. So it was called Norwegian Winter. It was called Norwegian Winter. And I realised straight away, this was in March 19, uh, March 2011, I think it was. Mm. Might have been 12, can't remember. But um, she was 90 and it was the season, that time of the year is when you see the Northern Lights, the Aurora yeah. Borealis. Yes. So nothing to do with astronomy. The trip had been booked to take my mother-in-law on a cruise. I got in touch with the cruise company and said, I teach astronomy at the local college. I do lectures in various places, you know, primarily yeah. in the Isle of Man. I do occasionally <laughs> one in the UK. Do you want any astronomy lectures? No, well, we do, but you have to go through an agency. 
oh, do you? They said, yes, we do have uh, astronomers in our books and we do allocate speakers to Fred Olson, which was the shipping line that we were going with, um, but you need to come and attend an audition. Oh, down in Brighton. No, thanks. No worries. No worries. Forget it. We were going on holiday, my wife and I. We still love travelling. We love travelling. People think I only travel because I do the cruise lecturing. I don't. My wife and I always go on holiday somewhere every year. So we went across. We were going to Sri Lanka. My son lives in St Albans. So we went to see our son in St Albans. And I thought, oh, while I'm here, I'll go down and do the audition. It was a terrible day. And I was that close to just forgetting it. Yeah, not going. But we went. And I'm doing my Aurora Borealis lecture, which I thought, how appropriate. That's what I want to talk about, so that's what I'll do. Yeah. And I played a music track in the middle of it. One thing I always do with my lectures, I learned years ago, is don't just drone on like I'm doing now. Don't just drone on. <laughs> this is where we put the music in. You're not, yeah, exactly. you're not droning on, it's fine. Sh- show videos. Yes. Show, tell yes. jokes. Yes, absolutely. Mix it up, Put yeah. music in. Mm. So at a particular point, I had a series of images of the Aurora. It was a time-lapse video of it, done in Norway by National Geographic, I think it was. But it was silent. I thought, how boring is that? You're just a silent, beautiful Mm. pictures, but silent. Mm. So I played the song Northern Lights by Renaissance. I don't know if you know it. I don't It's it's a real classic old song. Yeah. So I played that. But unfortunately, what had happened is the projector didn't work on the wall. um, So I had to do it on the laptop. So I've got my laptop and a tinny sound coming out of the laptop, which is showing the guy I was doing it to. Yeah, yeah. The boss, a chap called Peter Rushton, comes running out. Who's playing that music and why? stood there watching it and he thought wow that's amazing it, it, that's fantastic i love that he loved the music never mind me yeah, yeah good so that's how i got into doing it yeah um they then said to me well if you come on our books you've got to give us 50 pound now as a registration fee i thought oh do you <laughs> and when you do your first cruise you give us 50 quid as well and after that there's no charge other than a, a, a well they, they want some sort of commitment that exactly. you, you are going to turn up i guess and uh well, I did. Yeah. I gave them 50 quid. I nearly did. But I thought, oh, what the 50 quid? I can afford yeah. to lose 50 quid. So I did. And I went to Sri Lanka. We went on holiday and I came back. I had a lovely holiday. And I got a phone call from Peter. Howard, he says, I know it's short notice, but we've got a cruise. Would you be interested in doing it? Were to Hawaii. <laughs> <laughs> so how long did I think about that? Not long. Not long at all. So we went to Hawaii <laughs> and it was the year that um, um, Will's, not William, yeah, William and Kate got married. Right. Because I remember watching it on the ship yeah, with yeah, a okay. bunch of Americans. Yes. So that was my first cruise and I've been doing them ever since. Oh, my and, uh, really? it's, uh, That's it's, a great story. It's a lovely story. Yeah, it is. And of course, they got the second 50 quid off me, but uh, that was... Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think you've had your money's worth since then yes, by the look, looking at where thir- you've been. 34 cruises I've done since then. That's all right, there. isn't it? Eh? Yeah, no. yeah, that's great. So when I meet people as a financial planner, the day job, um, what's your earliest memory of money? I'm yeah. glad you asked me that because I, I looked it up. Obviously, you sent me the questions beforehand. And uh, I remember, I don't know how old I was. I must have been seven or eight. I was old enough to be allowed out on my own. And I lived in Liverpool. My grandmother lived next to the primary school. And... I can't remember where I got it from, but somebody gave me a pound. So I went to the local garage. It was a shell garage up the road in Booker Avenue, Liverpool, if anybody knows Liverpool. And I went into this garage and I bought an Aero. I bought a chocolate Aero. I think from a long distant memory, but I think I bought an Aero and I think I bought two or three other bars of chocolate. Okay. And I had 18 and sixpence left. I know. And I had this money in my pocket and I goes home and I've eaten the chocolate and I've gone home and my mum spotted I had this money in my pocket. Where'd you get that from? Oh, I got a pound. Where'd you get the pound from? So I told her wherever it did come from, I can't remember. And what have you done with it? And of course, although I had most of it left, I had squandered, if you like, that one and sixpence or whatever it was. It would be about right, yeah, sixpence for a bar of chocolate, so three bars of chocolate would be about right. <laughs> she played act with me. Yeah. Wasting money and you shouldn't do that. You should, at least you didn't spend all of it, but you shouldn't have done that. And I remember vividly, it was 18 shillings and something. It might not have been 18 yeah, yeah. and six months, but I had 18 shillings left. I'd bought the chocolate and I just put the rest in my pocket and thought, you know, I'm rich now. I can do things with that. And that's probably my earliest memory of spending money and being told that you should save it and you shouldn't just squander it and all the rest. Yeah. Did, that shape, you, did that shape how you, you dealt with Probably. Yeah, probably. And you, how mean, you're doing today. I, I hope so. I mean, I've never been rich. 
rich, as it were, but um, we're, we're comfortable. I think, obviously, we're retired now. <laughs> if you're not comfortable when you're retired, you've got a problem. But um, it, it always made, stuck with me that you should look after the money you've yeah. got. Don't yeah. squander it. I mean, yes, buy yourself a treat every now yeah. and then, but don't just buy three bars of chocolate because you can. No, it's buy good, one bar it's of good chocolate and lesson. keep the rest. It's yeah. a good life lesson. And it's st- yeah. I never, ne- not thought of that story for decades yeah. until I, I saw it when yeah, you were no, going to ask me it. So. Well, thank you for sharing that. No That's worries great. at all. So of all the things you've done throughout your life so far, what things have given you the most fulfilment from from both a, a personal and business perspective? Well, from a personal perspective, of course, getting married and having our children and walking my daughter down the aisle yes. when she got married in oh. uh, 2007. That was, sorry, 2006 it was. Yeah. Um, those are the obvious memories that um, everyone's got and mm. you, you treasure them and you will take them with you till you die. But probably the most dramatic thing I've done in the astronomical field was... Um, I got involved in astronomy, as I've told you, over the years, and I did more and more work for Manx National Heritage and so on. And um, in 2000, in the year 2000, when we established the Astronomical Society Observatory, um, I got a phone call from a chap who wanted to come and see the observatory. Chris Stott, his name was. Uh So Chris comes to the observatory, and he's showing, I'm showing him round. I was chairman. No, I wasn't chairman at the time. I became chairman in 2003 to 2014, I was chairman. Right. Um, So I was press officer then or whatever. Yeah. Um, But a, a... uh, founding member of the organisation. So I took Chris up to the observatory and we had a good round and he said, you know, my wife's an astronaut. And I remember to this day and I've told him the story. Yeah. Give it over. Nicole, Your wife's an astronaut. Nicole. Then, Nicole Stott, yeah. yeah. And she was. Yes. She yes, trained yes, to be an astronaut yeah. in 1999. I think she was appointed and she went to fly twice and all the rest. And we'll talk about that in a moment. But... I got friendly with Chris and I've been friendly with him ever since. And he's, him and Nicole are wonderful people, absolutely yeah, marvellous people. And what Chris has done for this island mm. in the field of space exploration and space um, industry and commerce is another story in its own right. But Chris um, and Nicole, and Nicole was finally allocated to a mission, um, STS-128 it was, which was scheduled to launch in 2009, in, Dece- in August 2009. So we're all excited about this and Nicole because she was a rookie astronaut as they call them. They're allowed to have um, uh, a ground crew or inverted commas, which is people who are just interested in it. And she denotes um, a charity. She comes up with a charity. And so you all get T-shirts and it says on the back, Nicole's ground crew, STS-168. And there's a logo on the left breast here. Brilliant. And um, so does anybody want one of Nicole's T-shirts, says Chris. So <laughs> went round the society and there's about a dozen of us wanted the T-shirts. So we got the T-shirts. Next thing I get an email. It's a long story, but it's worth it for the end. Next thing is um, Chris says, we'd love to get a picture of you all wearing your T-shirts with something Manx in the background so what can we do? I know what we'll do. I went for m and Laxie Wheel was an obvious figure, conf- idea, yeah. but no, the observatory. And you know, we went to the observatory one Saturday morning. It was a cloudy day, but we found a banner that said Alamo Astronomical Society. I thought, oh, we'll, just, we'll just have this. We found a Manx flag and an American flag. So like a team photo, we're yeah. all there at the observatory with the banner, with the little flags and so on. And I remember Gary, my friend Gary saying, Shall I change the clouds? Shall I make the clouds go away? Shall we make it a nice day? No, leave it as it is. It doesn't matter. <laughs> Sent the picture to Chris. Nicole gets launched into space and we have our AGM of our society in mid-September. Now she's gone into space on the 31st of August. She's there till mid of November. So she's there for three months. Yeah. I get an email from Nicole in space from the International Space Station. It said Nicole stop ISS yeah. Yeah. and NASA.gov or whatever. Uh-huh. And I opened it and there's our picture of the observatory in the window of the space station. No way. Absolutely. Brilliant. And I, so I do talk to schools and I yeah. get asked all sorts of stuff and people always say to me, Mr. Mark, have you been into space? Yeah, there's my picture. <laughs> and that picture, that was just incredible. And Nicole was such a marvellous ambassador of the Isle of Man. We've got wonderful yeah. pictures of her with a T-shirt on. Yeah, and the sure. Man. But there's another story yeah. related to that, which comes back to your question, which is something that... Um, personal fulf- or professional fulfillment yeah before she goes into space probably about the july time chris says to me i'm allowed to do a family conference with nicole once a day on video once a day or once a week i can't remember the details we'd like to use one of those and we'd like you to talk to her on video live from the isle of man right. and we want you to get some school children involved brilliant so, and it was unofficial because it was part of the U- U.S. government. Um, so oh, Chris was sacrificing his personal time. So it would never work. But we asked all the school children 
of the island, six secondary schools in the island of Man, including King Williams, to come up with questions. And we awarded a prize to the top one of each school. So six Wow, that's students a really good idea. Came to the yeah. Manx Museum uh-huh. and we did this live link. Yes. We didn't know it was going to work. We thought it would work. And I was the host. Yeah. So there's me sitting in the... You can look on the internet for this. You look at me, yeah, I'm sitting there. And at one particular moment, I shake my head. I'm thinking, this is never going to work. I gave a lecture first on Nicole's mission because if it hadn't, we had a full audience. We had right. them... We had them... Uh, Don Gelling was there. He wasn't chief minister then. I think he'd... Yeah, so before he was chief minister. But we had a full audience, including yeah. lots of children. The whole point was to have lots of children. Yes. And the footnote, we had the people who asked, the, who got the second prize and the third prize up as well. Wow. So they were all there. Yeah. About 50 from each school, um, or 30 from each school, whatever it was. So we start the lecture, I give the lecture. I then, we were told we had to ask the questions, but we weren't allowed to show that we had an audience. So all they could see on the TV screen was me with two school children next to me, and we alternated them, obviously, to ask the questions, and the screen with Nicole on it. And that's what we all saw. The fact that I was on the stage in the Manx Museum with 200 people in front of me was the academic. Yeah, neither that, here nor there. <laughs> that didn't bother me, but what no. did bother me is all of a sudden I'm trying to get hold of this um, this astronaut to try to talk to us. Yeah. And, of course, it worked a treat, and it was oh. absolutely <laughs> phenomenal. Yeah. It was amazing. She started off chatting to us over um, the Pacific, approaching California, and she finished talking to us over the Indian Ocean wow. after Africa. Gosh. And it was just absolutely incredible. I actually got into deep trouble for it because Chris came to see me um, a few months after and then Nicole had come back and he was chatting to me. I got a lovely photograph from Nicole um, to her ground support team, which is on display in the observatory. And um, he said to me, you're in deep trouble. Why am I in deep trouble? He said, well, that live link you did which lasted about 45 minutes. It was meant to be 20 minutes, <laughs> but you kept talking. And I said, well, of course I kept talking. I wasn't going to hang up on her, and she wasn't going to hang up on me. And in the end, across the bottom of the screen, there came a message, this call needs to end now. <laughs> so we ended it. And what had happened, the astronaut on board the space station, a chap called Frank DeWitt, who was a European, uh, space, uh, um, European Space Agency astronaut, he was the commander of the ISS, his boss was waiting to talk to him in Darmstadt in Germany. Germany. Oh. And we were just prattling on me yeah, and Nicole use, about using the air the time here. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. But it was such a success. <laughs> the six kids came up and asked the question. Yeah. We realized that Nicole was still going and thought, well, I'm not going to stop it. No, no. We got the second and the third children to ask their questions Brilliant. as well. And the kids just loved it. That's, a, and, that's um, such a great story. And that's, yeah. that was one of my pivotal moments, oh, if my. you like. It. And that was the peak of my astronomical career. Yeah, I that's suppose. lovely. I was ground control for a day. <laughs> but we couldn't talk about it. No. We couldn't publicise it because it wasn't um, US government. No. Or it was a US government, but we were in the Isle of Man. I guess you're safe now to talk about it. Well, we, we publicised it in November, but it had yeah. lost the impetus then. Yeah. It lost the headline. I get emails every day, practically, from my sco- um, NASA to say that astronaut Jessica Myers or whoever is talking to the school, the school in I don't know, Oklahoma. Okay. And you get that every week or so. So it's allowed now. So they, they, they From America, but not from the British no. Isles. I mean, there was a big fuss made a few years ago when um, Tim Peake went up into mm, space, yeah, British yeah. astronaut, fair enough, good credit to Tim and everything else. Um, but they made such a fuss about him talking to a British school. And I thought, we did that in 2009. Yeah. But, hey. oh, no. but it's a great story. Yeah, that is a great story. And uh, it's, it's um, one that... Uh, I remember with uh, fond memories. Yeah. No, thank you so much. That's a, no, no that's an excellent story. It really is. So for any existing or aspiring business owner, entrepreneur, what would be your number one business tip? Don't give up. Persevere. Have confidence. I mean, I wrote down one answer to that question, confidence. And yeah. it's all about confidence. Have the confidence in what you're doing or what you're trying to do to take it as far as you can. And um, I never aspired to be an astronomy lecturer and um, talking to the International Space Station and lecturing on cruise ships. That was never a career goal in, in, in my life. I never thought that. I think I had a good career. We earned a good income. I got a job in the civil service and all that. But sometimes things happen by serendipity, I think it is. Yeah. And we talked about yeah. education earlier on. I mean, Get, I mean, I got asked a question. I gave a lecture the other day. It was actually a, a broadcast um, throughout the world. It was broadcast by Viking cruise ships. And I got lots of questions from Americans at the end of this. And someone came on and said to me, what would you say to children? And that links to your question. Yeah. What would you say to children? And I said to them, the same answer I'm giving to you, never give up. Have the confidence in your own abilities. You can do anything. 
no matter how old you are, you can do anything if you put your mind to it. You might not get to the peak, you might not go into space, you might not get an Olympic gold medal, but if you can do your very best at anything, yeah. be it academic education, be it sport, be it just a personal event, a goal, um, go for it and yeah. keep persevering. And it, it, it's amazing what, what you can get. Oh, I couldn't agree more. No, thank you for sharing that. Oh, my pleasure. So what do you do to relax? How do you keep your life in balance, Howard? Well, my wife complains I'm always on the computer. I'll sit watching television. But, you know, it's funny. <laughs> Again, you asked this question, I prepared for it. Because my wife, when I started doing my university study, I was working full time. And I realised that, obviously, I needed to study. So I went to work upstairs and study. And then I realised with computers, you can actually bring computers downstairs and sit them on your lap and play on them as my wife says <laughs> and she plays act with me because I'm always on my computer even when I'm relaxing I'm on my computer isn't that called turfing when you're on, on the PC Tur Sur so. surfing, surfing and watching the TV at the same yeah. time it's called it's turfing called, I didn't know that oh I, I should tell so. that when I go home I'm turfing yeah. kids do it a lot <laughs> I, I do it a lot but we love we love travel we've always enjoyed travel even mm. though I'm fortunate enough to do the cruises we love travel uh, obviously we're not travelling at the moment no no how do you see that playing out another couple of years maybe I think so it's going to yeah. be some time I don't think the world is ever going to return to the same as it was even even with a vaccine, I think there's so much social um, issues with this. Mm. 20 years ago, if this had happened, it would have just been another bug that had gone round and, okay, terribly, it had killed lots of people, but it would have just been another bug. Um, but with social media and everything else, and it's just escalated. I just can't see. We're in a hole. Mm. We're in a huge hole, and I don't know how we're going to get out of it. The vaccine is one answer, but then you're going to get the people who don't want to have vaccinations. And where do you, where do you draw the line on that? Herd immunity, I guess. Yes, so. I think herd immunity is the ultimate answer to this. Yeah, um, but you think so. But um, how long is it going to take? I don't In the know. meantime, the economy, I mean, we're so fortunate. We've just been across, I was telling you that at the beginning. Mm. Um, we are so lucky over here. We don't realise how lucky we are. It's worth people going across and realising how it is. You yeah. go into Marks and Spencers or whatever, other stores are available. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and you see so, you have to queue up to go in. You have to wear a face mask all the time. Yeah. It's just not nice. No. So, what, I mean, what would you say are the best things about living in the Isle of Man? Oh, I love the rural environment. I love the natural um, environment. I cycled here today. It's a yes. nice day. Coming along the it's, railway track. It's a great track. path, isn't it? Oh, it's what fantastic. A great it's fantastic. It's, a, it's the, absolutely one of the best, best cycle tracks in the mm. British Isles, I think. And I just love the scenery. I just love the... And I think, to be fair, I mean, the, we, the government, and we we're going to come on to that, people get a lot of criticism to the government and everything else, but I think they've played a blinder on this mm. COVID situation. I mean, the situation today, only announced today, I don't know if this is going out, but he only announced yesterday, Howard yeah. Quayle, that they're stopping the seven-day testing. Yeah, so I heard it's that, It's a positive. Yeah. I actually, we looked, my wife and I went across, and we seriously looked into doing it, and I was prepared to pay the money to do it. But if you did pay for it, you could still yeah, it's, it's only not, go out. You couldn't go to the shops no, or socialise. I, I guess so. only for, for, for curiosity, if you display yeah. no symptoms, no, for the no, no other reason, really. Yeah, I think that was done for the business community. I think people who wanted to go across could go to work yeah. if they were clear, but no. No, no, fair but enough. I, I just love the... the, the I mean, everyone's a friend in the Isle of Man. You meet people all the time. We went to Guernsey this August, and the people of Guernsey were just like the Isle of Man. It was an air bridge to Guernsey, yeah, and Guernsey yes. was like a suburb of the Isle of Man. No, it's still going on. It's still, and it's yeah, fantastic. Yeah, it I mean, the people were so friendly, and um, yeah, lots yes. of friendly no, people. No, no, good, it is, you're right. It's a great environment you're to right. live in, and um, it's, it's a great place to live. Yeah, but it has its challenges, and, and it what, would you, what, what would you say the challenges are? The biggest challenge the Isle of Man has got, I think, again, I rehearsed this one, if you like, is uh, that I think the Isle of Man has become part of the worldwide community. We were a tax haven. No bones about it. We were a tax haven. We didn't like the words, but we were. We had our own independent financial um, system. Uh, it was never done, established as a tax haven, but the benefits of setting up in the Isle of Man or living in the Isle of Man were known to the world. And there were lots of them around the world. But... Um, transparency has come in now. That is no longer the main industry of the Isle of Man. It hasn't been for many years. Uh, we've got to move with the rest of the world. We've got to move with the times. And I think the worldwide place we've got um, is something we've got to do something about. And I think the handling of the COVID situation has encouraged people to want to come and live here because of it. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what the island's got to do. We've got to emphasise our differences, but at the same time show that we yeah. can do things in a much better way. Yeah, I mean, I can, I can share some some actual uh, information on that, I guess, because, you know, we are a regulated company. Of and, uh, you know, absolutely, it, ha had, had, it has, has its, uh, its problems with its tax haven mm. um, reputation. However, 
things have changed so much. I mean, for example, our business, uh, what, 10 years ago, we would have spent maybe 10% on turnover on regulation compliance. It's compliance. It's more like 50% mm, these days. Be, it's, yeah. uh, you know, it's a huge... Well, the banking overhead. sector, it's, it's a huge yeah. thing since the crash in 2008. Yes, and the banks have majorly capitalised, so... Oh, yeah. yeah, it's, uh, yeah. No, we've, got, we've got to be transparent, and we've got to be in a democratic country. Yeah. We are, and um, we talk about democracy and all that sort of stuff. I mean... Well, who is it once said that the best sort of political system is a benevolent dictatorship? Yeah. But those days have long gone, as yeah. you see from the COVID situation. Yeah, you, yeah. Every day the news is about who is short of money as a consequence. It was the football league or it was the charities or it's the cinemas. And of course, they're all saying, it makes me laugh on the radio and the television because one day they're saying the restrictions are too much. Next and the day. next day, the restrictions are too hard. Yeah, you know that's politics, and that unfortunately is what the job of a government have got to do. Yeah, and yes. I don't envy them at all. No. So, what solutions and opportunities could you see? I that's one answer. Well, I can't give you an answer to that. I mean, I was involved in politics. I actually was an Onkin commissioner for about thirteen years from oh, two thousand and well done. It's no, not, 1991 to two thousand and three. Yeah, not, not many people do do public service, but you no, know, you I, need to, I did it. Yeah. I enjoyed it, but I was never a national politician. Yeah. I never wanted to be, and I. I think the way the public treat politicians is appalling. I think the uh, because they they're not allowed to um, have personal opinions. Um, for every opinion you've got, there's someone going to have a, an opposite opinion. And uh, I wouldn't go into politics now for all the tea in China. <laughs> and um, if I was a government minister, I I think uh, I think I very rapidly would um, would resign. <laughs> I don't think it's an it's, an, it's, no, an, it's not for an everyone, unenviable it's, it's, job. No, I agree. And I did put my toe on the water. They say and I actually stood for MLC, believe it or not, once, but I didn't get elected, obviously. But um, I think I'll uh, stay as I'm doing. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Me too. So, um, what plans have you got next? What's the, you know? What's the sort of longer term? Um, um, well, obviously, I want. I'd love to carry on. Well, I do want to carry on lecturing and doing. I love talking to an audience. I mean, I'm doing a series of lectures. I'm doing a virtual cruise around the Isle of Man this um, Are you really? winter with Manx Nass and Heritage. I'm doing oh, fantastic. A, a different lecture each month, I, uh, like yeah. I do on the cruises. I'm doing one. Oh, it doesn't matter what the subjects are. I'm doing oh, one great. in November, okay. December, January, February. Yeah, sure. So I'm doing that. Mm-hmm. I'm still involved with the schools. I'm still involved with giving talks yeah. to anybody who wants me to give a talk. Okay. And uh, I'm going to write my book. No, brilliant. So, so I mean, that's I'm, my, my for, yeah. short-term plans. Well, we, if you give us all those resources, we, we can put links into, oh, obviously, Manx Retirement Association, the mm-hmm. The, um, the Astronomical Society and your, your yes, I will do. So, but the um, the Max National Heritage event, I guess it'll appear on Bright's talk at some point. Um, I think they're Facebook advertising it already at the moment themselves. Max, yeah. it's on the, the website. For some reason, they only advertised three of them. They're not advertising the November one. Yeah, I don't yeah. know why, but it doesn't matter. But I'm also doing a talk to the children's farm at the end of this month. Which right. Is okay. To raise funds for them, I'm doing one in Milltown for them. Are there any books that you've read recently oh. that you'd recommend to our listeners as a sort of a source of, I don't know, self-development, philosophy, just a good read? Two I've read recently. One would be for anybody. One was called Curiosity, and it's the book written about the Mars Curiosity rover that landed on Mars in 2012. Oh, yeah. mm-hmm. It was in Onkin Library, and I picked it up thinking, oh, this will be boring, it'll be very, very technical and very scientific, but no, it was a fantastic read by the chap's name of Rand Manning, Rob Manning his name is, right. and it's called Curiosity, How We Landed on Mars. Fantastic. And the human interest side of that, how they did it and the things that they went, the hoops they went through to get the funding yeah, sure. and how things didn't work and how things broke and, yeah. oh, it's absolutely incredible and it was popular, it, it was relevant and I read it because they're going to land on Mars again in February mm. uh, with the successor to Curiosity called Perseverance. Right, okay. So that was a fantastic book. Oh, good. Yeah. Another one I've read, I'm not into the highbrow scientific stuff, even though I do read it, obviously mm. it's part of my lecture research, but I've just read another one called Astrophysics for People in a Hurry <laughs> by Neil deGrasse Tyson. Oh, yes. My, my husband's oh, reading that at the moment. It's a wonderful yes. little book. It's a fantastic, it's yes. a book you can pick up and read and then read again and again yeah. and again. And I love Neil, Neil deGrasse Tyson. Yes, he, he is amazing, he's, isn't he's he? He's like Patrick Moore was, yeah. I think, all those years yeah. ago. And I uh, met Patrick, you know, a few times but that's another story um but uh, neil degrasse tyson he's really put this book into exactly what it says on the tin it's for yeah. people in a hurry who just want to grasp the concept of that's the universe right. the big bang and yes. quantum physics and all those sort of things it, it's a great little yeah. book it's, I, I on, it's on audible as well you can get yes. it yeah which is what we've got it on i think yeah. it's on audible it's, it's highly recommended yeah no very good right so what's your favorite quote well you asked me that and i thought 
what's my favourite quote? And maybe in the blurb you sent me to I thought, what's my favourite quote? And I came up with three, so I'm afraid you're going to have three. Go on, go for it. The first one, I can remember these word for word, but I wrote, I printed them out so I remember them. The best one, I use this at the end of my Exploring the Universe lecture. It's from an ancient Greek known as Ptolemy. I'm sure you've heard of Ptolemy. Man must rise above the earth to the top of the atmosphere and beyond, for only thus will he fully understand the world in which he lives. That was written 2,000 odd years ago. <laughs> and it's as relevant today as it was sure then. sure is, yeah. That's one. Mm -hmm. A bit more recent, Einstein. And this is one you've got to think about. The most incomprehensible thing about the universe is that it is comprehensible. The ability of the human mind to actually work out. I mean, we are tiny in the greater scheme of the universe, and that's a subject we could talk about for hours. But when you think of the size of the human body against the size of the universe, and yet our brains are able to comprehend these things, mm. that is just incredible. Yeah, And that's something that I, I've always been fascinated with. But I suppose my favourite one is from Muhammad Ali. And people think, Muhammad Ali is a quote for astronomy. Well... Impossible is just a big word thrown round by small men who find it easier to live in the world they've been given than to explore the power they have to change it. Impossible is not a fact, it's an opinion. Impossible is not a declaration, it's a dare. Impossible is potential. Impossible is temporary. Impossible is nothing. Yeah. Thanks. Wonderful quote. That's good and it links really well into your advice for, yeah, you know, have definitely. confidence and just go for it. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, no, great. So, um... Where people can go to learn more about you, we're going to put that in the in, yep. the, in the show notes. But um, yep. Howard, do you want to tell me about the Dark Skies project? Yeah. I, I know you were involved in setting that up because that's, that's so. something linked to the biosphere, is it, if I'm right? Is it anything to do with that? I wish it was. No. It is minor to an extent. In 2011-12, the Alamand government issued a document about the way forward for tourism. And amongst the things they recognised as a potential for tourism was Dark Skies destination tourism. Max National Heritage suggested I looked into this and we got someone over to look at the Isle of Man and we realised that the island, we don't realise it living here. Uh, we do now because they've done a lot of publicity about it. We got this chap over and we worked out where were the best places to look at the stars in the Isle of Man and we identified seven places. Yeah. Seven places were identified. We applied for dark sky discovery status for all seven and all seven were granted. My goodness. This was fantastic. We realised we were on a winner with this. Yeah. I was asked by the Department of Tourism to look for some other sites. So we identified a further 19 sites, one of which here is at St. John's at the end. Um, yeah. As I cycled along, I realised that the, um, the car park here is a Dark Skies Discovery site. Okay. Um, so we identified a further 19. That was great. 26, the largest concentration of Dark Sky Discovery sites in the British Isles. Not surprising. Fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> the next step was to go for international recognition. Yeah. Through the International Dark Skies Association based in uh, Arizona. So we applied for um, Dark Skies Discovery status for 26. We yeah. got it. And it would be great if the island did go forward and became internationally acclaimed as a Dark Skies place. And um, there are places all around the Irish Sea. Um, in Ireland, in Galloway, in North Wales, in Anglesey, that are internationally acclaimed. And uh, it would be great if the Alamo was to follow suit. Thank you uh, so no much, problem. Howard my Parkin, for being my guest today on Island Influences. My pleasure. And uh, yes, thank you. Thank you for listening to this episode of Island Influences from Thornton Chartered Financial Planners. To find out more and for useful links, visit thorntonfs.com slash podcasts. Thank you.